So I'm sort of going to do another segment on uh, financial stuff. Um, one thing I didn't mention was my uncle inherited quite a bit of stuff um, in 1984. He sort of had a lot of dreams to uh, go and have backpackers places, you know, build backpacking hostels um, and things of that nature. And he spent a lot of time talking and a lot of time, you know, going on about it but not actually putting these things together. Um, and at the end of the day, what ended up happening uh, was he'd borrow more money for it and say he's going to do something and then he'd sort of fritter the money away or buy a piece of machinery. He'd buy so much farm machinery that it was just about scrap metal. It wasn't funny. Um, you know, and what sort of ended up happening was he, he keep buying this stuff and then sort of um, half the time it would sit there and, and rot and do nothing and he'd talk about building more of these things. He might spend a day a week actually working on one particular house he had trying to turn it into a youth hostel and managed to put a second story on it and do stuff, but he'd do one day a week for like six months. Um, you know, maybe on occasion he'd do two days a week, but that was very, very rare. Um, and then he sort of wouldn't touch it at all for another six months, and then he'd be back in again. Um, but the whole time he'd be borrowing money to do this, and he, he sort of uh, would then spend the money on either farm machinery or just plain, you know, living, buying himself you know, nice food and all that sort of stuff and you go down and get donuts and, and whatever else he wanted sort of thing at lunchtime and meat pies and, and whatnot. And at the end of the day, basically, um, he would have, the, you know, the, the creditor knock on the door and, and or, you know, send him a letter basically saying, uh, you haven't made several payments you know, what's going on. So he'd be in a mad panic for about a week. He'd refinance everything. Plus, yeah, why not? Get out more money on top of the refinancing um, and even some more to make more payments and make the odd, you know, few payments until he was starting to get a bit low on money and then just, you know, stop making the payments again. Um, and then, bang, another creditor, you know, get another letter and, oh, hell, i got to refinance you mad panic for a week again and he'd refinance yet again but when that week was over um quite simply see it's getting bright quite simply um once he sorted out his money problems money would be the last thing on his mind once those documents were signed and he made the call yes it's all gone through mr knight then that'd be it bang it just Money would be the last thing he'd think about. It was just, you know, completely forgotten about until several months down the track it'd be another threatening letter or, and then it sort of he'd be on the hop again trying to bloom and um, get it all, you know, under control again. And he sort of done this from 1984 to 1998 and all hell broke loose in 1998. Oh man, it's a year that some of us want to forget in the family. It was a hell of a year. It was very, you know, I as a 16 year old boy saw the grief that family members went through, particularly my uncle. He couldn't handle it and essentially went into denial and blamed Freemasons. We spent the next eight years, every time you'd see him, He'd have to mention something or bring up the subject of his former creditor who sold him up. This went on for eight years after he'd been repossessed of this stuff. But to see sort of such a calamity of repossession, I mean, I'm not talking he just lost a house. I'm talking he lost, this is what he had, family farm is 300 odd acres. Another farm is about, I think it was about 320. There's another farm is like 170. Now, buying that farm is really what pushed the interest through the roof and really what sunk him, um, that second farm. But he also had two houses in Geelong, 
and he had the place that I'm now living on, which he did manage to refinance and keep by the skin of his teeth. Even after he died, they come back for a second bite to grab some more money out of us, would you believe it, out of his estate, what was left of it. Um, but quite simply, in the space of about, oh, I'd say it'd be only about two months, they went around and systematically kicked him out of all these joints and sold him up. And we're talking he lost about... Today's terms, cost-wise, there'd be about two and a half million dollars worth of real estate. Um, at the time, it was half a million, but in today's terms, it'd be about two and a half million dollars worth of real estate. I mean, he didn't just lose his car or something like that. He lost two houses and two farms, um, and only hung onto this 50-acre place by the skin of his teeth. Um, they say you can learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, they can say you can learn from your own mistakes, rather, but you can also learn from other people's mistakes. Take my word for it. That sort of has put me off credit for for life, pretty much. I, I'm not saying I'll live completely without any form of credit, um, but, you know, I keep things tight in the credit world, very tight. Um, I essentially only have one loan that has to do with debt that was left behind on this place um, on my uncle's old place where I now live and that's the only form of credit I have um, I went and bought that car I got now, I was working massive weeks, I'm talking 83, 84 hours a week, you know, I'd get to the end of a shift and I wouldn't even know what my name was, that's how hard I was working at one point and while when that, you know, was happening, I was putting all this money away. You didn't have time to spend it. You were too tired on the weekend to do anything. The fact of the matter is I was working about six days a week anyway. Um, and when all that was over and the work died down, this is actually in the height of the GFC. I was working 83 to 84 hours a week. And when that all died down and, and that, um, you know, I knew my car was just about had the gong. Um... And so I had to go buy another one, and I went and bought the one I now drive, the propane vehicle you you saw, the white one, the high-end Ford 99 model. Uh, I went and bought that not on propane for $9,000, and it cost me something like, I don't know, grand and a half, and the government actually was handing out grants and stuff at the time, so I used some of them. Um, but I think it was about three and a half grand total to convert it. But a lot of that I didn't pay. I only paid like not much more than a thousand bucks. Um, but, you know, I've, I've seen people that have got cars that have cost them three and a half grand and they've got a loan on it. If you can do without loans, do without them. Um, because you do without this blimmin' little rope around your neck sort of thing. And... Uh, if you've seen repossession, as I had, and the level I have, you won't want credit. You'll be happy to be living with, you know, not a great deal of credit cards you can lean on and just buy this and buy that and boom, boom, boom. If you see what dramatic effects occur when you don't pay, um, you know, it wasn't just my uncle was hurting out of this. This is a lot of people. They were all family members who, you know, um, were in their 70s and, and that. And, and uh, you know, they were just... These friends, none of them could believe it was happening. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of hard words said and a lot of blooming people that were... Particularly my father, who was, you know, just in disbelief and holding back tears at, at, at what had happened. You know, his family, father, the, the, his childhood home was gone. Um, and when something like that happens and you see the way all your family members are, are taking it and whatnot, you know, I used to think he was rich, you know. 
because he had so much gear. And a lot of it, quite frankly, was just old machinery, but he had heaps of it. Old cars flaming everywhere. If you reckon you've seen Hillbilly flaming old car yards out the front of Hillbilly, you got to go and see a place where you got like about 40 cars in one, you know, three or four acre area. you got to see to believe it. And having all that stuff, as a kid, I thought he was rich. And then he told me, no, all this is borrowed money. Oh, is it, I thought. And I didn't really comprehend when I was like 12 years old. Um, you know, I just thought, oh, it's borrowed. Therefore, you can just, you know, work for a month or so and you'll be able to pay it back. But I didn't have a clue at how deep he was in. I had no idea of it as a 12-year-old. And, and when I actually... I was actually with him the night he received the letter that said the game's over and I was just sort of sitting near him and I sort of leaned over and I could see the figures on the page and that's, I'm one of the only ones that knows it was half a million dollars for a fact because I was, besides him, I was the only person that actually saw the official letter to say the game's up, basically. Um, but yeah, you know... It might be nice to have fan dangles. It might be nice to have money to fall back on. If you want money to fall back on, have savings, believe me. Because it all sounds groovy, having all this credit, until you see what can happen when the flaming teeth come out. And, yeah, it's nasty. So, um, that's just something that I wanted to uh, say in regards to finance, and that sort of formed a bit of my opinion on... Uh, money and how I handle money.